now I'm going to turn it and I'm going to turn it over to Emily for the meeting logistics. Emily. Great, thanks. So as Christine mentioned, this meeting is being recorded to minimize background noise. All attendees are on mute and we'd ask you if you haven't already to um, enter your name and affiliation if relevant. Um, you can rename yourself by going to the participants plan panel um, and hovering over your name and selecting the rename option. We can go to the next slide. So there will be opportunities to participate. Um, the latter half of the presentation is going to be dedicated to both clarifying and substantive questions, and we'll have brief pauses throughout as well. So if you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment, please raise your hand. You can find the raise your hand function in the participants panel. And then when it's your turn, we'll notify you, announce your name, and ask you to unmute. And with that, I'll hand it back to Christine to go over the agenda and some background. Great, thank you, Emily. We, we do have quite a bit to cover today and we're excited to talk about the framework. Um, before we get to that, I wanna thank you for joining us and for your participation in our, so, in our previous sessions over this year and engaging on this issue. And to so many of you who have provided your thoughtful and helpful comments, um, let's see, see um, how that helped shape the framework. Wanna note again, we are very much interested in and encourage your feedback on what we're covering today and we do welcome any comments going forward. And just to note, and you'll hear about this again, comments may be submitted to the MassDEP Climate Strategies email, and that's climate.strategies at mass.gov. In terms of the agenda, the first part of the agenda today is to provide an overview of the Clean Heat Standard Draft Program Framework. Um, but I also wanna note that the draft framework is not a regulatory proposal, but does reflect our current thinking on the clean heat standard and um, also reflects the many comments we've heard to date. The second part of the agenda is to hear your questions and comments. Next slide, please. For background, the Massachusetts clean heat standard concept was first introduced in the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030 and was subsequently endorsed by the Massachusetts Clean Heat Commission in its final report last November. In addition, the Mass Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2050 also adopts the framework for the clean heat standard and tasked MassTEP as the lead, lead agency, although we are coordinating closely with other agencies. Our focus is to develop the standard to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the thermal sector and importantly, implement it in an equitable manner, which you'll hear quite a bit more about today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Will to start the presentation. Will? Thank you, Christine, and thanks to everybody for <clears throat> joining. Um, we're gonna start with a familiar slide, just very briefly around what the clean heat standard is. Um, if you're interested in more detail, there are other materials I'll talk about in a minute, but just as a brief reminder, we are trying to set up a standard, which means we're trying to um, um, address the amount of clean heat that's happening over time. And to do that, we take the different types of clean heat and, and think about them in terms of what we're calling clean heat credits. And once we've created that idea of a credit, we require heating energy suppliers to hold those credits, either by purchasing or by implementing clean heat themselves. And we also obviously need to set up rules for the creation of those credits. So that's the basic core concept of a clean heat standard. And where, where we are now is we're moving beyond sort of the general idea of a clean heat standard to some of the more detailed requirements. So we've published this program framework as the focus of this presentation, and we are looking for comments um, this month. I'll, I'll go over that in a little more detail in a future slide. Next slide. So just a couple of other reminders about things we've talked about in the past. We're, based on some stakeholder comments we received early in the process about how we should address um, stakeholder actions, we've kind of divided things into two separate streams. One is our virtual community meetings stream, which it, next week is going to play out as a couple of evening meetings um, and a kind of a targeted for a more general audience and more time for question and comment sort of a format. 
and then separately technical sessions, which is what we're doing today to delve into the details for those of us that are really concerned about um, every every aspect of the details. And as we've said before, we'll take questions, suggestions, comments anytime to our climate strategies email box. Next slide. So wanna also just make sure to remind you what all is available on our um, web page. We have some things that have been up there for a long time, a two page summary of the clean heat standard concept along with a short video and translations into a number of languages. Um, a number of, of several white papers on different aspects of the clean heat standard, including um, uh, different technologies, um, crediting schemes that may serve as models, and also about issues around which, which entities might be obligated to comply with the clean heat standard. We also had had for a while posted now comments received during the spring 2023 um, summer um, comment period and also a brief summary of those. Since that time, we've added some new material that we know some of you have seen, but I want to make sure everybody is aware of. We've posted additional file of comments received over the summer and also a brief summary of those comments. There are slides and videos from the June, July, and August meetings. So, for example, if you want a more detailed presentation of the basics of a clean heat standard, that's in one of the earlier presentations. We've posted something that we said we'd come up with later this year, which is a um, concept kind of um, straw regulatory text around how crediting would work for early registration in the, the of the full electrification credits. Um, a new document that I'm, I think is going to be useful to us, which is a frequently asked questions document. This is a new addition, and we do expect to update this on an ongoing basis. Um, we've been receiving some questions and we're hopeful we're going to be able to post an update next week in advance of the comment deadline and also add an appendix with a spreadsheet with some more information about what the numbers in the framework really mean. So stay tuned for that um, next week. And just in general, please, um, you know, continue to submit your comments. We don't promise to answer all of them immediately, but we'll do our best to update that on an ongoing basis. And then finally, kind of the star of the show today, which is the draft framework for stakeholder review. Next slide. So just brief commentary about next steps. We have, since this is not a regulatory proceeding, but it's an informal stakeholder process, this is not a hard deadline, but we would like to have comments on the framework by December 21st. So we have um, you know, as, as much of the information we can as we go into the new year to think about, about refining our program design. Um, and we'll also take comments at any time on the early registration program um, regulation, but we do expect to spend more time talking about that and working on them early next year. We're also close to proposing fuel supplier emissions reporting regulations, as we said we would do um, this year. And then um, we, uh, as I said, we'll continue to update the FAQ document and hold our, our sessions like this one. Next slide. So on to the, the draft framework. Next slide. So again, Christine said this, but it's really important to emphasize this. This is the document that outlines key elements of the, the Clean Heat Standard Program so that we can start to think about writing regulatory requirements and, and you know, also to direct our stakeholder discussions, give you something to react to, help us refine some of the details. Um, it's, it's not a regulation and it's not a proposed regulation as such, it doesn't include every detail. It's a framework to give us the basis for working on more detail in a proposed regulation. Um, and we've divided into four sections that address the different um, components that we'll need to sort out to um, promulgate a clean heat standard. Next slide. So I'm just going to preview um, the bulk of the technical presentation, which is going to be given by my colleagues, Emily and Angela. Uh, and we're going to go through it in these four sections. We will pause very briefly between these sections for clarifying comments on the particular material we've just covered. 
but it, I'd like, you know, just focus on the fact we're trying to divide it up into different topics. So uh, you may need to hold questions about some topics until we get to them. So the first of the four topics is going to be is titled setting the standards. And by that, we mean the overall um, requirements across the state. So requirements around full electrification and around reductions statewide in, in emissions. And the fact that the standard will phase in gradually over time, starting you know something comparable to what's going on now and gradually increasing. There's also an opportunity for a program review in 2028 to revisit some of that. So that's the first of the topics covered in the framework. And that's really about the, the, the overall standard. And that leads to the next topic that you're gonna hear about um, in a few minutes, um, which is the regulated heating energy suppliers. In other words, who has to do what under the standard, which heating oil suppliers are regulated and how much of that statewide obligation is each individual regulated entity responsible for. That needs, leads naturally to the third topic, and you know some of you are I know most interested in this one. Just you know make sure you wait until till this topic comes up. Um, so we're we're then going to talk about where the credits come from, and the the we'll talk about the focus on electrification and the um, uh, idea of looking back at this in 2028. And, uh, and also a little bit about eligibility of, of biofuels. And then finally, um, people who have worked on crediting and trading programs in the past know that there's a lot of details that can, that can um, you know, need to be worked out that can provide flexibility and also some revenue at generated aspects of it. And that, that's a particular focus with this program because of our focus on building equity into the program right from the start. You've heard about some of our ideas there in the past and we'll go into those in more detail. So that's the outline of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over now to, I think, Angela for the first of those four topics, setting the standards. Great, thanks, Will. As we'll mention, we're going to start off by discussing the overall requirements that would cover the statewide heating energy sector as a whole. Just a note before we begin, we'll be defining key terms as we go, but if you have any questions about specific definitions, you can refer to the glossary slide that we have included at the end of the presentation, which you can download off the Clean Heat Standard website if you haven't already. Let's start by talking about the statewide standard. The Clean Heat Standard would include two main requirements an annual emission reduction requirement from building heating systems and progress toward full electrification of buildings. We'll focus on the overall requirements for now, and Emily will go over which entities would be obligated to comply and how to calculate a compliance obligation in the next section. First, we have the annual greenhouse gas emission reductions requirement, which would require that emission reductions increase by an annual 1 million metric tons each year from 2026 through 2050. As a result, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions reduced by the program each year would increase steadily. For example, the standard would be set to 1 million metric tons in 2026, then increase to 2 in 2027, then 3, 4, etc. each year until reaching 25 million metric tons in 2050, which is approximately equal to the amount of emissions produced by the building sector each year in Massachusetts. These emission reductions would be generated in part by electrification. We'll talk more about how to generate credits later on in the presentation. The second requirement is the full electrification standard, which would phase in from 2026 through 2030 by requiring an increasing number of full electrification projects to be completed each year. After 2030, the standard would remain at 100,000 projects per year. For example, the standard would begin at 20,000 residences in 2026, and increase by 20,000 per year until reaching 100,000 in 2030. Additionally, a certain portion of these projects would be required to support low-income households. This requirement to support low-income households will take the form of an equity carve-out, which would require that a minimum of 25% of full electrification projects serve customers who are eligible for the low-income discount electricity rates available through their electric utilities. This figure projects the potential cumulative number of full electrification projects and equity projects that may be completed under the Clean Heat Standard. 
at least a quarter of all electrification projects would need to serve low-income households, visualized by the orange line at the bottom. Because the full electrification standard would increase each year, the size of the carve-out would increase as well. For example, the number of electrification serving low-income households would be expected to increase by about 5,000 per year until reaching 25,000 in 2030, and then continue at that level each year thereafter. The full electrification standard would also be inclusive of clean heat installations supported by other programs, such as the Inflation Reduction Act rebates, the Alternative Portfolio Standard, and Mass Save. We want to make sure that electrifications that are completed through these programs would count toward the statewide standard. All right, I will hand it off to Will for any clarification questions, and then we'll turn to Emily to walk us through regulated heating energy suppliers. Great, thanks. So again, still to come information about regulated heating energy suppliers, credit generation and compliance, flexibility and revenue. And I don't want to hold this up too long by taking verbal questions, but I guess I just check with Josh, if there's anything in the chat that's like a straight clarification of what we've heard so far, anything that may not have been clear? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. So we'll have an opportunity later on anyway, if, if people feel like they missed an opportunity there. So I think we're going to move on. So Emily, uh, let's hear about regulated heating energy suppliers. Great. Yeah. So in this section, I'm going to talk about um, what types of companies need to comply with the clean heat standard, and then how those overall obligations that Angela just talked about would be divided up among the different types of companies, and then how we would calculate the actual compliance obligation for an individual company, so what an individual company would be responsible for each year. So to start, the clean heat standard would apply to retail sellers of electricity, natural gas, heating oil, and propane, and each of each company would be um, subject to both the full electrification standard and the emissions reduction standard. So they'd have requirements under each of those each year. So starting with the full electrification standard, um, this figure shows how it's divided up between the electricity sector and the fuel suppliers. So the sellers of propane, heating oil, and natural gas. Let's start by looking at 2030 and we'll walk through this. So you can see the bar for 2030 shows the overall obligation, the 100,000 residences um, that need to be electrified in 2030. The dark green portion at the bottom is the part that the fuel suppliers are responsible for with the striped area at the top representing the equity carve out. So in 2030, 60,000 of the total 100,000 full electrifications that need to be happen would be the responsibility of the fuel suppliers with 15,000 of those needing to serve low-income households. And then the light green bar at the top um, for 2030 shows the portion of the obligation that's on the electricity sellers. So the remaining 40,000 full electrifications would be the responsibility of the electricity sellers with 10,000 of those needing to serve um, low-income customers. If we take a step back and look at the figure overall, we can see that the obligation increases steadily for both the electricity sector and the fuel suppliers from the start of the program through 2030. And then after 2030, as more and more customers electrify, more and more of the obligation shifts on to the electricity sector and away from the fuel suppliers. So now we can talk about the same thing, but for the emissions reduction standard. Um, Again, let's look at a particular year as an example to start walking through this. So if you look at 2035, the overall requirement is 10 million metric tons of emissions reductions for that year. And the dark green portion of the bar at the bottom represents the amount of the, that the fuel suppliers are responsible for. So that's 3 million metric tons in 2035. And then the light green portion, the remainder of the bar is 7 million metric tons, and that's on the electricity suppliers. So again, taking a step back, you see the overall obligation um, increases steadily by 1 million metric ton each year. It starts on the fuel suppliers in the early years of the program. And then as with the electrification standard, after 2030, the obligation begins to shift onto the electricity suppliers. Um, again, recognizing that more and more customers will be electrifying. So now we can talk about how we would actually calculate a compliance obligation for a company. Um, we'll start with the full electrification standard. So for the fuel suppliers, the clean heat standard regulation would specify a number of full electrifications required 
per metric ton of emissions reported each year. Um, like Will mentioned at the start of this program, we are planning to propose emissions reporting requirements for heating fuel suppliers later this year or soon. So that would be the emissions reported that we're talking about here in this presentation. And then for the electricity sellers, similarly, the clean heat standard would specify a number of full electrifications that are required per megawatt hour of electricity sold. And this would be for each year. So from 2026 to 2050, there would be a number specified for both the fuel suppliers and the electricity sellers. Then to calculate a compliance obligation, you would multiply this number by, for a fuel supplier, the metric tons of emissions reported, or for an electricity seller, by the megawatt hours of electricity sold. And the requirements for each year are based on the overall full electrification standard that Angela described at the start, and then estimates of future building emissions to determine the full electrifications per metric ton of emissions, and estimates of future electricity sales to determine the full electrifications per megawatt hour of electricity sold. Um, and the framework includes periodic program reviews every five years, um, which would be an opportunity to revisit these numbers if needed, um, if they need to be recalibrated over time. All right, so on this slide, we'll talk through the same thing, but for the emissions reduction standard. Again, for the fuel suppliers, the regulation would specify an amount of emissions reductions required per metric ton of emissions reported each year from 2026 to 2050. Would be the same for the electricity suppliers. So there'd be a specified amount of emissions reductions required per megawatt hour of electricity sold for each year from 2026 to 2050. To figure out how many emissions reductions an individual company was responsible for, you would multiply this number by either the metric tons of emissions reported for a fuel supplier or the megawatt hours of electricity sold for an electricity supplier. And again, as with the electrification standard, these numbers are based on the overall emissions reduction requirement that Angela described at the start, and then estimates of future building sector emissions um, to determine the amount per megawatt hour of emission, sorry, per metric ton of emissions reported, um, and future electricity sales to figure out the amount per megawatt hour of electricity sold. And as with the full electrification requirement, these numbers could be recalibrated during the periodic program reviews. So now we'll look at an example um, based on a hypothetical retail electricity seller. Um, and there's a lot going on on this slide, so we'll walk through it a little bit slowly. But um, this is an example compliance obligation for a retail electricity seller with 10,000 customers. Um, we've assumed that each customer uses six megawatt hours of electricity each year. So this retail electricity seller is selling 60,000 megawatt hours of electricity each year. Um, let's look at 2035 to start. So the dark green bar shows the number of full electrifications that this sample electricity seller is responsible for. So they're responsible for 47 full electrifications in 2035. Um, and 25% of those um, need to be serving low income households. So that's 12 in this case. And then you can see there's the orange line. So in 2035, the electricity seller also has an emissions reduction obligation. So they're responsible for roughly 4,000 metric tons of emissions reductions in this year. Um, again, these numbers are calculated for an example electricity seller using the process that I described on the previous two slides. And that's done for each year here. So you can see over time, the standards phase in, um, the green bar showing the electrification requirement steadily increase, and then the orange line showing the emissions reduction requirement um, is zero in the early years of the program when that obligation is on the fuel suppliers, and then increases after 2030 as the obligation shifts onto the electricity suppliers. So now we can look at the same example, or not the same example, but at a similar example for a fuel supplier. So this is an example compliance obligation for a fuel supplier with 10,000 customers. And we have estimated, or we have assumed five metric tons of emissions per customer. So this is 50,000 metric tons of emissions reported per year to calculate these numbers. If we again look at 2035, the dark green bar shows the number of full electrifications that this um, sample fuel seller would be responsible for. So 100 in total. And then the striped area at the top is the equity carve out. So 25 of those 100 
um, full electrifications need to be serving low income households. And then the orange bar shows the emissions reduction standard. So for 2035, it's about 8,000 metric tons of emissions reductions that this example fuel seller would be responsible for. Similarly, if we look at the big picture, um, both of the obligations increase steadily from the beginning of the program through 2030. And then after 2030, um, as the obligation shifts onto the electricity sector, the requirements for the example fuel seller decrease. And by 2040, there's no more obligation on the fuel seller. So like Will mentioned, we're planning on putting up a spreadsheet that would allow people to look at these numbers more closely and run examples of their own. Um, and I am going to pass it back to Will now before Angela talks to us about credits. Great, thanks. And I think what we're trying to do in this part of the presentation is, is make sure everything is clear and not sort of address the, the reasoning behind some of these things. I think I did see a couple of questions in the chat that fit in that category to me. They were along the lines of exactly which companies would be regulated. So for the electricity sellers, the framework envisions regulating the, the companies that sell electricity at retail. So that's the competitive electricity suppliers, the investor-owned utilities with respect to the customers that they serve at retail, the municipal electric companies that serve retail load, and the, a similar range of companies in the gas side. And then finally, for the fuel oil part of it and the propene, we have um, on our website uh, uh, emission reporting requirements for those companies in, in, um, in a discussion draft form from very early in the year that identify the fuel suppliers that deliver the fuel um, at the retail level as the regulated entity. So those would be the companies, and then again, just briefly, to summarize, there'd be sort of a, a lookup table in the regulation where if you're one of those companies, you would look up for your particular year and company type, um, a, a, a sort of a compliance factor, and that you would multiply your activity by that to figure out what your obligations were in different parts of the standard. Um, just very briefly, Josh, is there anything else in the chat? Doesn't We don't have to get to everything because we can get to things at the end, but is there anything else that seems like a completely a clarification type question? Uh, one question on full electrification uh, does include disconnection from existing gas, oil, propane supply. Sorry, I meant a clarification about regulated heating energy suppliers, but that's a great segue into our next topic. We found that people always help us along by asking about the next topic in this presentation. So glad to hear about that. Um, so let's move on to credit generation. Angela. Thanks, Will. All right. So like Will said, we're going to talk about how to generate credits to comply with the clean heat standard. So in order to demonstrate compliance, obligated entities would need to either produce or acquire clean heat credits or checks. Let's start by talking about the different types of credits. In the clean heat standard, there would be two types of credits, one for each type of standard. For the emission reduction standard, obligated entities could use emission reduction credits to fulfill their obligation. Emission reduction credits would be generated each year on an ongoing basis from using clean heat. In other words, actively using clean heat, such as by running a heat pump in winter as your primary source of heating, would receive a set number of credits each year. For the full electrification standard, obligated entities would require full electrification credits to meet their obligation, which would be generated on a one-time basis upon the installation of the clean heat project. As we mentioned earlier, the program would start by defining full electrification as replacing a combustion heating system with an electric heat pump that can carry the full thermal load of residents. Full electrification clean heat credits would be generated one time for the installation of that equipment. Regulated energy suppliers could obtain credits of either type by either implementing clean heat themselves or purchasing credits from a third party, such as a heat pump installer. To start, we plan to launch a voluntary early registration program that would begin before the full clean heat standard regulation is in place. This program would encourage early action by registering full electrification projects that are completed before the full launch of the clean heat standard. This program would not include a compliance obligation. Participation in this early action program would be limited to residential full electrification projects that both install electric 
heat pumps that are capable of meeting 100% of space heating needs, as well as remove all combustion space heating equipment. Alternatively, instead of removing that equipment, residences could commit to limiting the use of remaining combustion equipment to backup or emergency situations. The projects that meet these requirements would be eligible to receive full electrification credits. The department would offer administrative support to early action projects with resources targeted toward registering or equity carve-out projects. At this point, we have posted a discussion draft regulation for this voluntary early registration program on the Clean Heat Standard website, and we welcome comments on the program. While this program isn't the focus for today's meeting, we'll be scheduling future meetings that will center around it. Once we launch the full Clean Heat Standard, additional actions would become eligible for crediting. As with the early registration program, full electrification projects would receive full electrification credits on installation. The full Clean Heat Standard would introduce emission reduction credits, and full electrification projects would begin receiving those emission reduction credits annually beginning the first year of operation. Hybrid systems or electric heat pumps that retain a fossil backup system and don't meet the full electrification definition would receive annual emission reduction credits by demonstrating the use of that heat pump, such as through billing records. For documented delivery of eligible liquid biofuels, um, they would also be eligible to earn annual emission reduction credits toward the compliance obligations of heating fuel suppliers. At this point, weatherization and energy efficiency measures would not be eligible for crediting to avoid complexity and redundancy with mouse save. And to support the equity carve out, any credits that serve low income households would be marked with an identifier in our system. Let's talk a little more about emission reduction crediting. Credits would be granted to eligible actions based on the following four principles. First, Homes that are fully electrified would be credited for five metric tons of reduced greenhouse gas emissions per year. This value represents an estimate for the average number of emissions generated by a single residence in Massachusetts. A residence with fully electrified heating system would receive credit for those five metric tons of emission reductions each year, regardless of resident size or whether it was an apartment or a single family home. Second, Homes that have an electric heat pump that don't meet the full electrification definition would be credited for 2.5 metric tons of reduced emissions per year. This essentially gives half credit to residences with hybrid heating systems. For example, this category could include residences that have an existing heat pump with a fossil backup system, or homes that have a heat pump that isn't meant to operate in cold climates, or a heat pump that isn't sized to heat the full home and therefore relies on a fossil backup system for part of the year. Third, non-residential commercial projects would receive emission reduction credits based on the amount of averted emissions. These projects would need to demonstrate implementation of clean heat and emission reductions, and the methodology used would be consistent with the methods used by other programs. Fourth, eligible waste-based liquid biofuels would also receive credit based on the amount of avoided emissions. Those avoided emissions would be calculated based on the amount of emissions released by the combustion of an equivalent amount of heating oil. There are many other types of biofuels and the clean heat standard would credit other liquid biofuels that are eligible for the, fuel, the federal renewable fuel standard at half credit through 2030. Ownership of credits would also be clearly outlined in the regulation and the default owner of a credit would vary by type of credit and creditable action. Full electrification credits would be owned by property owners that installed clean heat unless the ownership of that credit is transferred. Similarly, the emission reduction credits produced by those electrification projects would also be owned by property owners by default unless they were transferred. In contrast, emission reduction credits produced by the delivery of blended biofuels by obligated entities would be owned by the company delivering the fuel. We've mentioned several times that there is a default owner unless transferred. The department expects that at least some property owners will assign full electrification credits to heat pump installers or other intermediaries. And then those entities would reflect the value of the credits and the prices that they offer for their services. So we want to note that the credits generated through the Mass Aid program would be assigned to retail electricity or natural gas sellers, and those would count toward their compliance obligation. 
So as we discussed, the start, the clean heat standard would credit for electrifications and eligible liquid biofuels. In 2028, we would be required to consider expanding eligibility to other fuels during the initial program review. Additional fuels would be evaluated based on a set of three criteria. First, we would consider a full life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production and utilization of the fuel, including the assessment timeframe. Second, uh, a detailed analysis of fuel availability, including the status of an anticipated timeline for production products, as well as an analysis of alternative uses of that fuel. Third, we would consider any effect that the alternative fuel would have on local air pollution, including both production and combustion of the fuel. These three criteria would be used to determine what fuels to credit in the future. After the 2028 review, the department would also have additional program reviews at least every five years to recalibrate the general requirements, assess equity outcomes, and look at all aspects of program design and how the clean heat standard has been implemented so we can make improvements as the program continues. The heat standard would also include details regarding measure verification and a data storage system. Verification measures would draw upon the alternative portfolio standard, mass save, and other existing programs in order to ensure credit integrity while minimizing administrative burden. Regarding data storage, MassDP would contract for the development and hosting of an electronic clean heat and emissions tracking system, also called CHETS, to provide for efficient program implementation. All right, I'll pass it back to Will for any clarification questions on this section. Great. Thanks, Angela. Um, I was kind of skimming the chat while you were talking, and I, I think you addressed um, the basic questions, which were about, there were a couple things about eligibility of a couple fuels that we're not proposing to be eligible at this point. But one thing I would point out in Angela's presentation is that, you know, the framework says we won't add, we'll consider adding other fuels in 2028, but we've also put down, you know, that's a draft framework, and we consider options in relation to comments. And we have published three different kind of criteria that we think are important to consider. So if people are submitting comments on eligibility um, of fuels, they might wanna consider addressing those three categories that Angela mentioned. Um, so I think we're gonna, gonna move on to the last portion of this and hear from Emily about compliance, flexibility, and revenue at this time. Great, thanks. So. I'm going to talk about um, a few of the compliance flexibility mechanisms that the framework includes. So specifically credit banking, weather normalization, and alternative compliance payments. And then there are also two provisions within the draft framework that could result in revenue, which would help us um, promote equitable outcomes from the program. So those are the alternative compliance payments and what we're calling a just transition fee. Um, so we can go and talk about the first compliance flexibility mechanism, which is credit banking. So credit banking is when a credit that's created in a certain year can be banked or saved for use in a future year. And the framework would allow credit banking for the full electrification credits um, without limit. So they could be banked um, in terms of there's no limit on the amount that could be banked. And there's no limit on the time frame within which the banked full electrification credits need to be used. And this would help ensure an adequate supply of credits, particularly in the early year of the program, and then support the development of a durable and liquid market for the credits. Next, we can talk about weather normalization. So colder weather drives higher emissions. Um, so during colder winters, the electrification of a heating system avoids more emissions than during a more mild winter. So the framework um, suggests using a credit multiplier um, after particularly cold winters. This credit multiplier would essentially adjust up the value of the annual emissions reductions credits created by electrification projects. Um, and this would happen before the compliance deadline so that they kind of would be adjusted up to reflect the colder winter and the increased avoided emissions. And the third compliance flexibility mechanism is an alternative compliance payment or an ACP. So this is a common feature of many um, credit-based programs and essentially that would allow the regulated companies to make a payment instead of holding credits themselves. Um, so ACPs would be allowed in the clean heat standard and this table shows the amounts that the framework includes 
for ACPs. So for the full electrification credits would start at $6,000 per residence in 2026 and gradually increase up to $10,000 per residence in 2030. <clears throat> then, sorry, the equity full electrification credits, the ACP for those would be twice that of the normal full electrification credits. So $12,000 in 2026, and then increasing up to $20,000 in 2030. And then for the emissions reductions, the ACP would be set at $190 per metric ton of emissions reductions. So on the next slide, I'll talk about revenue. So, and so what the revenue collected from the ACPs would be used for. So ACP revenue would primarily be used to support additional clean heat um, and clean heat credits in future years. And the framework specifically identifies that um, ACP funds from the equity carve out would be used to support future low income full electrifications. Like I mentioned, there's also a just transition fee concept in the draft program framework. So this would be a fee on full electrifications that are not eligible for the equity carve out, so that are not serving low income households. They would pay a fee of 10% of the ACP value on the first transfer of those credits. And the revenue generated from those fees will be used to assist low income consumers during the clean heat transition. The framework also notes that um, MassDP would consider offering additional support to low income households, particularly in very cold winters or times when heating energy costs are particularly high. And this could be funded either through the ACP or just transition revenue, other MassDEP revenue, um, or programs implemented with other state agencies. And with that, I will pass it back to Will. Great, thanks Emily. So I'm gonna just go, our, our primary objective here is for people to understand what's in the framework so that, so that people can think about how to comment. We're certainly accepting comments today also, but in that light, I just wanted to briefly go back and summarize what, what you heard um, just to make some of the highlights clear and then we'll move on to uh, questions and, and comments. So um, first of all, we heard about setting the standard by which we mean the overall statewide number of two types of actions that, that um, can happen. Full electrifications, which is driven by the need in our climate planning to have um, uh, use of heat pumps near universal by 2050, and then separately emission reduction requirements that are calibrated toward our, um, our, our uh, climate plan. I think the slide just switched on me, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and so, and we have also a gradual phase in kind of a concept there to make sure we're, we're getting off to a good smooth start. Then we heard about regulated heating energy suppliers and some detail about how the requirements apply for individual suppliers. Um, we heard about the electricity obligation and how it grows over time as the electric companies, you know, they have a stable customer base throughout the whole time through 2050 and they'll, they'll be growing. So we'll have a growing obligation on those. Um, the credit generation, we heard about two particular types of credit generation that we're focused on. Again, those really come from the climate plan planning process as the ones the most potential, but also a process and you know an openness for comments even now on including other things if we can get the information we think we need to, to be sure that they really should be qualifying as clean heat. And then finally, we discussed some details of market design and, and revenue, particularly related to equity. Um, so I think that concludes our presentation and we're ready to move on to questions and comments. Christine, I'm not sure if I should, I'll turn it over back over to you and then I think I'll be participating in the questions. I noticed there's a lot of questions in the chat. I think realistically, we're probably just gonna have Josh read them all one at a time, but um, we could, could approach it differently if you'd like. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, but also I want to reiterate that this is a draft program framework. So um, we're happy to hear all and any comments. Um, the framework represents a leaning, but we are uh, open to your suggestions. So we have not made final decisions on any of this stuff. And some of the questions we might need to be um, thinking a little more about and posting as part of the the um, FAQ 
this is a very complex program. We're trying to get it right. So again, we're, we're happy to take all your questions today. We might not be able to answer them all today, but we are committed to answering them and considering all of your input and ultimately in how we develop uh, proposed regulations. All right, uh, I'll take it from the top. Uh, Jonathan Parrott does, uh, can the speakers clarify how the clean heat standard is different or better than the Department of Energy Resources uh, thermal APS alternative portfolio standard? Will generators be eligible to earn, earn both AECs and CHSCs? I think maybe we should pull down the slides. I'm not sure quite what's going on there, but we don't need them anymore. Um, Christine, did you want to take that or should I? No, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think we're not here to talk about the APS program, but the Clean Heat Standard follows very much from the work of the Clean Heat Commission and then the direction in a number of climate programs to start building up a, a, a program like this. So uh, that that's kind of the origin of it. Um, it's not really defined in relation to the APS. Well, I, I think I think the slides reflected the fact that if there are certain things we can take credit for under the Clean Heat Standard, we will do that. So that, that's something we will look at. Very good, yeah. Uh, from Peter Evan, will gray hydrogen be regulated? The clean heat standard does not currently envision crediting gray hydrogen or any type of hydrogen. Uh, Amy Boyd Rabin, are the regulated electricity suppliers distribution utilities, IOUs, and MLPs, or energy suppliers competitive supply, municipal aggregators, and basic supply? Yeah, I think I addressed that earlier um, when I saw it come up. So I think maybe we can move on from that one. Yeah. Emily Levin, how does the reduction requirement of 1 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year align with the state's greenhouse gas reduction targets for the building sector? Yeah, so we've said a couple of things about that in, in the framework. One is that the both the overall reduction through 2050 and the reductions between 2025 and 2030 are aligned with the decrease in those um, limits in the climate plan, but we've also acknowledged the need for to be regularly recalibrating the standard to address the fact that we don't aren't able to sort of exactly control the emissions with this program, but just move in the in the right general quantity and direction of motion. Uh, from Peter Oven, how many total residences are in Massachusetts? Uh, I don't have an answer to that right now. Uh, Heather Dysdick, uh, why has DEP drafted a standard based upon gross emissions reduction versus carbon intensity of heating energy supplied, the latter of which is flexible as demand shifts across supplies? Gross emission reductions do not accurately incentivize nor achieve the same reductions as demand increases over time due to any number of reasons. Yeah, I, I think the general answer to that, and this might not be a perfectly targeted answer is that we, we there's a lot of um, cases where we have tried to create a simple and workable and understandable program that um, that that can um, you know be durable and um, that has resulted in us um, not addressing some of the complexities like that about the detailed emissions profile of different strategies we think it'll with the recalibration we can we can get the results we need but um, we haven't haven't looked in detail at every aspect of that topic. Caitlin Peel Sloan, can you talk more about the rationale for including EDCs other than extending the longevity of the program? How does adding a cost to electric bills help encourage electrification? Well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I have an answer other than extending the the durability of the program. I and mean, what, what we're expecting over time is that the electric companies have a very stable customer base because electricity is gonna be, is used in every home in Massachusetts now and will be through 2050 and that their, you know, those companies balance sheets and um, sales will grow over time. Um, and they're invested, you know, inherently in the electricity transition. So we think they are a good, a good candidate for inclusion in the standard. And as, as we've said, they, their requirements start small and increase over time. 
Nicole Martin to clarify, will there be any obligations on wholesale suppliers of propane and heating oil or just resale suppliers? As I said, we're, we're, we're close to making a regulatory proposal on that. We do have a, a discussion draft from earlier in the year that does not impose anything on wholesale suppliers other than reporting some reporting requirements. John Ackerley, is the electrifying low-income households tied to a lower price of electricity? Otherwise, electrifying doesn't necessarily increase equity. In fact, it could go the other direction. Yeah, I mean, that is a concern. I think that's one of the reasons we mentioned the just transition fee was to help with some of those economic concerns. So we're, we're certainly aware of that. Ben Butterworth, my understanding is that there are no compliance obligations for fuel sellers starting in 2020, 2040. Uh, can you explain why that year was chosen? And is there a quantitative analysis you can provide that explains the logic behind choosing 2040? For example, how much fuel is DEP expecting to be combusted in the building sector in 2040? I don't have particular numbers on that topic. I'll just defer to the explanation I gave a minute ago. Uh, Karen Arpino, is there any wiggle room to reevaluate other technologies before five years or to change that review timeline to less than five years? Yeah, I think I think you know this the framework is a draft for for stakeholder input. So there is the opportunity at this point for stakeholders to submit comments that address the questions we raised about other fuels in a way that might allow us to bring things in earlier. And additionally, we will be doing some additional stakeholdering, and there'll be another comment, obviously, when we propose regulations. So we have not made decisions yet. So we, we again, welcome your input. Bridget Mishad, uh, can anyone provide to the residents in the state that the electric grid can handle all of this electrification in the middle of a traditional New England winter? Well, as I said, there's a the program review in 2028 and regularly is you know meant to make sure that we can address any kind of complications that happen. But under the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, there's a you know separate set of policies and programs and um, you know agencies that are responsible for ensuring the electric grid you know grows as far as its its ability to provide energy and its clean energy over time, and also the regional grid operator has a responsibility around electric reliability. So we, we think that's that's embedded in the climate planning that's happened. Cole Martin, can you speak to how DEP will assign proportionate compliance obligations to new suppliers entering the market? I, th I think it's the same as what I just explained. They would be subject based on their um, activities in a particular year. Tim Johnson, where is wood in all this? Will wood and pellet stoves be banned? Good. Christine, I don't know if you want to take this. No, nothing will be banned in, in no. this program at all. No, there's no, we will not ban wood. I think another question is, is whether or not we, we provide credits for wood. And that's not something we have in the draft program framework, but we certainly are welcome to welcome comments. And, and we should clarify that that's not just wood that won't be banned. There, there is no fuel that's banned under this program. Right. Program allows consume, you know, helps consumers to make the choices that are envisioned in the climate plan, but does not ban any particular fuel. Karen Arpino is electrical grid setting getting assigned alternative compliance payments for its carbon contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So I think I'll just defer to my earlier answer that there are other programs, including DEP programs, our clean energy standard, and a cap we have on emissions from in-state power plants that address emissions from the electricity sector. And we're working under direction in our clean energy and climate plan to address the emissions from the heating sector and from buildings. Diane Malakatos, does this program take into account the greenhouse gas emissions produced by electric uh, central grid suppliers who typically operate at 30 to 35 percent efficiency. So I'll just defer to my previous comments on that. Thanks. Ben Butterworth, can you explain why DEP proposed a full electrification compliance obligation that is only applicable to the residential sector? Did DEP consider a similar requirement for the commercial sector? The commercial sector requirement would not necessarily need to be, quote, full electrification for buildings 
but it could, for example, require a certain percent of heating in commercial buildings to be electric. This seems like an important policy guardrail to protect against over-reliance on biodiesel in the commercial sector. Sure, I, th I think we'll just take that as a comment. That's something we're aware of that, that might we might be able to add to strengthen the standards either at this time or at a later time. Susan Cerner, how will the grid handle this? How much will it cost to upgrade the grid? Who is paying for that? Yeah, I think I'll defer to my other earlier answer on that. Amy Boyd-Rabin, would emissions reductions from full electrification count towards the metric ton requirements, uh, emissions requirement too? Yes, if it, well, once a full electrification happens, that project, for example, or, or that residence is eligible also to earn emission reduction credits in each year going forward, assuming they operate it in, as, a, as their heating source. Jonathan Fitch, does the regulatory authority in 310 CMR 777 in MGL Chapter 21N allow this regulation, and does 21N specifically mention all the energy and fuel suppliers you mentioned? Uh, on this question, the EP does have broad regulatory authority under the climate law, but also our own Clean Air Act, so we do have authority for this program. Whether it's mentioned specifically for energy and fuel suppliers in 21N, I don't have the answer to that. I think not, but we can get back to you on that. Evan Pitsley, has a study been completed to review the impact of installing heat pumps that now introduce air conditioning demand in homes that previously did not have air conditioning? This means more electricity will be used and higher emissions since electricity is not clean now. Not as part of the clean heat standard work, but certainly the grid operator, ISO New England, is constantly evaluating, you know, things that are likely to change electric load over time. Um, so, so that part of it would be addressed there, I think. Priya Gantbeer, how would the commitment to limited use be monitored and enforced? Uh, I believe that's in reference to fossil systems. Right. So I think that detail is to be worked out at this point. We've referenced and Angela mentioned that the Mass Save program has a framework around either removing the equipment or a commitment. Uh, also, the ability to earn emission reduction credits um, would be another incentive to operate the equipment um, that's that's been installed. But that is, I, I guess I will just repeat, that is a detail that we're still, will continue to work on as we refine the program requirements. Tim Johnson, hydropower is warming the rivers, which in turn are warming our Northern oceans and causing the Arctic to warm faster. So why is damming up rivers and flooding the North seem like a good idea? Uh, Reed Stevens, Cass Brax, Blue Deserts, hydropower should not be allowed credits for electricity imports. I think we'll just move on. That's not relevant for the clean heat standard. Ben Butterworth, has DEP conducted or is DEP planning to conduct any quantitative analysis projecting how this policy will impact retail rates of various fuels, electricity, gas, propane, oil under different scenarios, e.g. high use of ACP versus low use of ACP or high use of biodiesel to meet obligations versus low use of biodiesel to meet obligations? Yeah, we'll be refining the program requirements over 2024. And as part of that work, we, we recognize the need to look a little more at program impacts. Amy Boyd-Rabin, we know that people are using the MassSafe program to get, quote, whole home incentives for heat pumps, but then use their backup system anyway, despite having promised to only use it in an emergency. What's to stop a customer from doing that here? Right. So I don't have anything to add in my earlier answer that that's among those issues that we're looking at in more detail as we as we get into the program design. Also, I would say that um, the commenters are interested that may also want to pay attention to the full electrification early action program that we've outlined. Um, that's a place where some of the details of that are in writing already, and we'll be talking about more early next year. Nikki Littmeyer, does the requirement of heat pumps being capable of meeting 100% of space heating needs include electricity use and an electric resistance backup? I think that's another detail we haven't yet worked out, but likely yes, I think. Uh, Evan Pitsley, how does DEP reconcile that people are being pushed into electricity when electricity is being produced through burning natural gas at a less efficient rate? 
leading us to further environmental goals further from yeah i'll, I'll lead you to, i'll defer to my earlier answer that we have dp and the state as a whole has a number of programs to make sure that we have the clean electricity needed to power clean heat as we as we move forward Uh, Evan Pitsley, where does renewable propane fit into credits? Uh, at this point, we don't have a crediting mechanism set up for renewable propane. We'd be happy to receive more comments on that, I think. Uh, statement from Michael Ferrante that has been answered previously. Uh, Jonathan Parrott, please clarify which liquid biofuels are eligible and solid biofuels are not. Liquid biofuels emissions are poorly understood. Modern wood heating emissions have been investigated and well understood in Europe. Again, I think that might be a good topic to make comment on. I can say a little bit more about the liquid biofuels part of it, which is that um, we are, are suggesting that the um, waste-based biofuels that have historically been eligible in the alternative portfolio standard would be sort of fully credited here. In other words, if you if you use those instead of a fossil fuel, it would be assumed that you've avoided all the fossil fuel emissions. For the other fuels that are still <clears throat> eligible for the renewable fuel standard, which would include, that's a federal program, and that would include basically the other sort of biofuel substitutes that are in play would get a half credit. And that's kind of a shorthand for US EPA um, has a 50% reduction threshold and other pro programs have identified those fuels as providing reductions, but not, not full reduction. So we're thinking that, as I said, we're looking for a simple program and we think that's a, a way to simply distinguish between biofuels. As far as the wood, um, I think we're, we're um, again, we understand that's a topic for comment. And we've, we've identified some, particular um, topics that commenters may want to address around eligibility. Heather Dydzik, uh, the crediting section of the framework speaks only to liquid biofuels, but does not address low carbon gaseous fuels, hydrogen, RNG, and steam. Are these eligible? They are, are not under eligible under the, the draft framework. Jonathan Fitch, was a simple price on carbon for delivered fuels ever considered that revenue could be used to fund electrification through mass safe programs without significant admin costs? This must impose on every entity involved. That question, no. And I think we would need to look at the uh, authority on that one for your earlier question. Right. Jonathan. Now, if I could add, if I could add the, 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 the Clean Heat Commission really did a comprehensive look at what might be done to reduce emissions in this sector. And they they came to us with the clean heat standard as as the way to approach this issue. So they're, they're, may have, they may have thought about that, but that this is what they came up with. Jonathan Parrott, it seems as if DEP has the 2028 review backwards. Why not be more inclusive as the programmatic quickening? Uh, and then as we progress greening the grid become more selective in 2028. Last year, we saw only 19% of grid power deemed, quote, renewable across the six New England states. This included trash burning. So the Clean Energy and Climate Plan recognized an imperative to get moving on heat pumps so that we could be full electrified by 2050. So we're really focused on that. And then the biofuel supply that's already within the heating fuel supply um, we, again, as I said, are open to comments on other topics for inclusion, but um, those do need to, to be looked at in terms of the criteria that we've referenced. Linda Lancaster, I don't understand why electricity sellers are included in this list of regulated heating energy suppliers required to purchase clean heat credits. Uh, it seems to me this would tend to increase the consumer price of electricity, which would make heat pumps less attractive. We need to lower the cost of heat pumps to speed the install rate. Wouldn't it make more sense to exempt some electricity supplies? So one of the other things that maybe we should mention is that the, there is already um, heat pumps funded under electricity um, mass save program. So we're as as we said in the framework, sort of calibrating the startup so it's not too different from that, um, and that that you know will will 
will mitigate the any effects on electricity prices. And then I think I've you know mentioned a couple times our long term thinking about um, including electric companies, and that's that's also comes from a couple of documents that are on our website. There's a, a, a report from the Regulatory Assistance Project and also a, um, a, a, a white paper about regulated entities um, available on the, on the website. So consult those for more of our reasoning. Andy Krasner, when you consider the air pollution impacts of combustion fuels like biofuels, hydrogen, and RNG, how is that considered? Is there a specific cost associated with the pollution? Can you describe how you consider it? We, we don't have a specific framework around how to consider that in the context of a clean heat standard. So if you're submitting comments on eligibility in relation to those criteria, you may want to also suggest how we, how we think about that. Carrie Catan, uh, does using heating fuel as the baseline risk giving undue support to bio slash renewable propane that is likely replacing regular propane? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have an answer to that one. Sorry. Brian Davidson, so you will assess the availability of alternative fuels in 2028 after de-incentivizing their production up to that point. Yeah, I think I'll just defer to earlier comments about how we're happy to hear comments about how uh, about the urgency of including fuels before that date. Michael Savage, how do we ensure using renewable fuels like pipeline RNG are registered and exempted by the obligated retailers so that they are not burdened with an ACP? Otherwise, you pay more for the fuel and are also burdened by the ACP. I, th I think that's a comment we considered we could consider, and I don't think we've fully addressed it in the in the framework. It also is something that may be clarified a bit in the the reporting regulations that are that are forthcoming. Tim Johnson, conventional propane is 73% clean hydrogen. Not sure why it is getting penalized at all. It is also a byproduct of other renewable jet fuels, et cetera. Propane needs to be looked at as a solution instead of a problem. I think we'll just accept that as a comment. Linda Lancaster, is the alternative compliance payment option greater than the cost of buying clean heat certificates? How to ensure suppliers don't just use ACPs instead of reducing emissions? So I think we've we've proposed potential values for the alternative compliance payment, and and we we think they do meet that criteria. But um, we're happy to receive comment on whether those are the right values or not. Maura Ross, how do you, how does thermal wood energy play into this? Will you take the alternative disposal options for small diameter, low value wood, such as reducing forest management and increasing fire risk or landfilling increasing in landfill gas when calculating pollution rates? So I think I'm actually going to use this opportunity to point out that one of the reasons we gave for focusing on the liquid biofuels, which have, have a, you know, a long history of being credited in different programs and um and are you know in 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 um we haven't heard a lot of we're, 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 there are a lot of programs that are counting them and have detailed analysis of these things that aren't too contested at this point certainly that's also true of electricity but the, those are the options where we feel like we have the information that we need at this time so those are interesting questions about wood but th those are sort of examples of the kind of things that we're not ready to kind of make a decision on now but we think that 2028 is maybe more the right time frame for considering that those questions Heather Dysdick, uh if a regulated entity elected to pursue an ACP would they have to both a conversion-based payment and an emissions payment. If you're only awarding five metric tons per residence and using $190 metric tons for the emissions reduction, then the cost not cost of not achieving the residential emissions reduction is only valued at approximately a thousand and not six thousand to twenty thousand. So I think I'm not going to address the numerical part of it, but the answer as far as the standards is that the two standards, the full electrification, the emission reduction are are separate things. So you'd need to comply with both. You might comply with one or the other or both with ACPs. 
So similar how programs like our clean energy standard work, there are different components and they have different ACP levels and they're, they're, they're the same compliance entities, but they, they serve some of those components serve different purposes. Cole Martin, can you clarify how the just transition fee will work? Will that apply to all transfers, i.e. when a homeowner transfers their credit back to heat pump installer, or is this referring to transfers among market participants and speculators? So the concept as presented in the, the um, framework, which is certainly happy to have comment on, is that the fee would be collected once at sort of the first transfer of the credit. Um, not clarified yet whether that's necessarily the homeowner to some sort of a company that's going to take first ownership of the credits. But the, the concept in the in the framework is that it would be collected before that sort of goes into the trading market and then would not be collected at each at each trade. Sean Flynn, regarding the registration of liquid fuel suppliers, will there be a differentiation between bioheat sold to residences and bioheat sold to commercial properties? I think I should probably defer that to the reporting regulations that are forthcoming, but in general, we're going to, to um, um, have you know fairly detailed reporting requirements around our, our fuels. Cole Martin, do you have any updates on when the program might take effect? I see the draft framework includes credit holding requirements kicking off in 2026. Should we expect the program to be ready to go then under current plans? Yes. Uh, Gregory Pavlov, since the bottom line is that the system will ultimately result in higher costs to consumers to pay for the crazy amount of bureaucratic data collection and the bureaucracy required to administer all of this, as well as support low-income consumers, why not just be honest and raise taxes and then use this taxes to offset consumer purchases of the accepted heating appliances you want people to buy? The overhead and hassle of all this would go through would be much lower and won't support the additional administrator positions required, of course. I think I'll just thank you for the comment and defer to my earlier comments about the Clean Heat Commission process that, that led us to choose the Clean Heat Standard approach. Diane Malakatos, uh, thank you for keeping an open mind on this draft proposal. Uh, Robert Rio, I'm confused about the ACP, particularly the 6K numbers. Does that mean a supplier pays that for avoiding one full electrification? Yes, or put differently, they pay that for having failed to avoid for each each full electrification that they needed to um, implement but didn't do. And those numbers are were in the discussion document earlier this year where we pointed out there are similar numbers in the mass save program as far as incentives to full electrification. Emily Levin, will long-lived electrification measures receive CHCs for each year they installed or just the first year? So there's two types of what we're calling checks. So if they're a full electrification, they would they would receive that 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 credit when they first complete the full electrification. However, all the eligible measures are also eligible for ongoing emission reduction credits. And so even the full electrifications would be eligible to continue receiving those credits over time. John Ackerley, the Vermont Clean Heat Standard seems much simpler and pays much more attention to equity, and is still unclear to me how LMI homes will be hurt or helped by electrifying earlier or later. Yeah, as I said earlier, we do have a number of aspects of the program that are intended to deal with, with um, equity, including this just transition fee. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, the decision to electrify is not something that came out of the clean heat standard process, but it's something that came out of the broader climate prep planning process um, in, the, in the Commonwealth. Ben Butterworth, what level of building sector emissions are you assuming in 2025 before the policy goes into place and does the 1 million metric ton CO2e reduction from 2026 to 2030 get us to the CECP building sector target given that 2025 assumption? Well, again, the numbers are not perfectly calibrated, but the connections are that the, um, and this is in, in one of our documents, that the, the building sector 
standard reduces by approximately 5 million metric tons between 2025 and 2030. And so over that time period, we are requiring that the companies accumulate 5 million metric tons of reductions. So that's that connection. More broadly, um, the in recent years, emissions have been um, as high as 24, 25 million metric tons. So the 1 million metric tons a year does get down to zero in 2050. But that that longer term trajectory is very much going to require recalibration during the program reviews, because not only um, you know do the emissions vary year to year, but we, we aren't making a representation that every time each home converts to um, um, clean heat that exactly five metric tons are reduced. We're using that as a as a kind of a way to simplify the accounting in the program, but we'll have to recalibrate regularly to make sure we're meeting those targets over the long term. Robert Rio, does the 2.2 million households envisioned here represent everyone in Massachusetts? How many full electrifications were done in 2022? Don't think I have answers to either of those questions. And Josh, maybe we should just do a quick check. Are we are we in a place where we may finish up with the list of questions in the next 10 minutes or are we far from the end? Uh it looks like maybe we have 30 more in the chat currently. All right. So should we spend a few more minutes and see how many we can get through? Sure. Uh, Stephen Dodge, why is DEP proposing a 50% reduction in crop-based feedstocks? No other jurisdiction has uh, or has proposed that limitation. A review in 2028 is prudent, but limiting credits for eligible feedstocks at that outset makes no sense and could potentially limit supplies to meet demand and further increase costs. Yeah, to clarify, I don't think we're limiting eligibility um, in the California and other trading programs, the different types of biofuels receive different amounts of credits. And what our proposal is that the crop-based biofuels would receive half of the credit of the waste-based biofuels. That's certainly not exactly consistent with all of the other numbers, but it's 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 um, a simple way of articulating the, the general scale of the difference in the different analyses. June Wooding, how do obligated entities create their own credits only through Massdave installs installs a portion to each company? Yeah, I think we have more work to do in spelling that out, but that's one of the ways is the Massdave installs. Another would be that the heating oil suppliers, many of them we've noted also deliver um, air conditioning services and may be able to expand their clean heat business over time to um, earn credits that they can use toward their own compliance obligations. Luke Miller, why is credit ownership uh, be assigned to property owners by default if DEP expects the property owner to assign ownership of the delivery agent upon installation, effectively sell it immediately? Doesn't this force another entity, all clean heat customers, to learn how the CHS works and create additional admin burden on customers and obligated parties? This is one of the recommendations that came out of the regulatory assistance projects recommendations and and the primary reason is to to make sure that it's very clear legally who has controls the credits but we think that the um, homeowners may choose and the industry may choose to create sort of standard forms that sign over those credits you know very early in the in the process or at the time of installation so that the homeowner doesn't actually um, end up handling the credits and would receive some sort of likely um, um, consideration in the price in, in exchange for, for signing over the credits to another entity. Noel Chambers, have you stated that MassSave will keep CHS credits, but have not mentioned if the MLPs will get to keep the credits if they provide incentives for a project? Also, who gets the credit where both an MLP and IOU serve the same customer? I think I don't have an answer to that this time. We'd be happy to hear more about it in, in writing or think through it at another time. John Ackley, how does Actually, LMI... that's a good that's a good plug for me to just plug the fact we do have an FAQ document. So that that's maybe one we'll think about looking at in, in that document. John Ackerley, how have LMI representatives been involved with DEP staff and externally? Um, I'll take that one. We've been coordinating very closely with our Environmental Justice Coordinator, Janine Simpson. We've also held meetings with 
folks representing um, environmental justice interests, which includes low and moderate income folks. Um, we have very much committed to continuing that conversation, including the two virtual community, community meetings next week. Noel Chambers, what happens to a utility if the substations that provide electricity to the area work being performed does not have excess capacity to serve the additional required load by electricity customers? Yeah, I don't have anything to add to my earlier comments. Evan Pitsley, who can we contact with a public information request to obtain project projected results that this draft framework would produce? It appears you are not prepared with that information today, and I would like official follow-up. So on that question, you can certainly submit a, uh, you can email the climate strategies email box. Um, I assume you're not uh, talking about a public records request. If you are, then we can we can walk you through that process. But again, we're we're accepting all comments and encourage folks to email the, the email. Should we, yeah. should we just do a time check again? Josh is the is the. Zoom, are we going to lose the Zoom at 2.30, or can we continue on a few minutes if we choose uh, to? I believe it will continue until we end it. <laughs> okay, well, should it get cut off, um, thank you, everybody, for joining, but we'll we'll, we'll hope, it, it, hope it stays on. Christine, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how to manage the last few minutes here either. Um, I would say maybe we can stay on for another uh, 15 minutes, and at that point, I think we need to wrap up, but... The chat is something that we can download and we can answer all these questions. And I would encourage folks to continue sending these questions as they're really helpful. Katie Eisman, we're concerned about the precedent that would be set by accredited liquid biofuels, quote, based on the assumed avoidance of all emissions from combustion of an equivalent quantity of heating fuel. Liquid biofuels have a wide range of full life cycle emissions. So how would you protect against perverse incentives? I think I'll mostly take that as a comment, but I, I will point out that we are only proposing the full offset for the waste-based biofuels, not for not for other biofuels that are eligible for the federal program. Jonathan Fitch, increased electricity sales does not mean lower electricity rates when the cost of achieving 100% and renewable generation will cost more. I think we'll just take that as a comment. Joe Uglietto, can obligated parties bank emissions Reduction credits, the framework only mentions baking for full electrification credits. Is there a low income carve out for the emissions reduction standard or only the full electrification standard? If not, why? There is no low income carve out for the emission reduction standard in the framework. Um, and I don't, I don't have, I'm not going to address the why now, except to say that we think the full electrification is really the important part for that focus for that topic. The EMSP program identified Massachusetts needs 30,000 megawatts of clean energy, and none of this is even in the queue now and is probably seven to 10 years away. And we can, the standard timing be changed from standard calendar based change to clean energy build out as an example of clean heat electrification requirements when 10,000 megawatts and in infrastructure are online. If I understand correctly, I think we can take that just as a comment about the electricity sector. Heidi Clifford, uh, what will be the carbon scoring method for low carbon fuels? How will different feedstocks be tracked in for commingled tanks? I think the details of that tracking are something that will be addressed in the, the reporting um, program, but the general concept is a and is, is around differentiating between waste and, and other biofuels. Uh, Heidi Clifford, how will the credit trading system work with a separate framework for low carbon fuels and electrification? So there are two types of credits. One is a one-time credit for full electrification, and the other is emission reduction credits that are something that a clean heat um, um, place that's using clean heat can earn every year. And the uh, emission reduction credits can come from either using biofuels or operation of a clean heat of a of a heat pump system, whether it's a it's a hybrid or a full electrification system. Brian Davidson, 
if in developing the clean heat standard, the DEP finds that there is flawed reasoning in the CECP, uh, are there any channels through which DEP can communicate that, or is the DEP bound to carry out the CECP's agenda with no questions asked? I imagine that at this point, Mass DEP is far more qualified than any of the drafters of the CECEP to lead the direction of this regulation rather than blindly following. So on that question, we, we do coordinate quite closely with other agencies under the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. So we'll take that as a comment. Joe Uglietto, why do both standards score the carbon footprint five metric tons of a 400 square foot apartment the same as a 5,000 square foot home? Additionally, why are the same number of credits and same values for those credits given to these two examples? Have you considered looking at the square feet of conditioned space when evaluating heat pump installations? We have considered that, and it's an interesting topic for comment. We did not, we were concerned that um, we didn't want to give more credit to bigger homes because that might um, um, compete with our equity goals. So we decided that that no matter what home size, the same amount of credit would be eligible. So that's the reasoning, but I we understand the, the question and are happy to hear more about the topic. Heidi Clifford, can the point of credit creation for low carbon fuels be determined within a contractual agreement between two parties? Will there be a crediting system for renewable natural gas and hydrogen? So there won't be any crediting at the, at the outset in the framework, you know, pending further comment for renewable gas and hydrogen. The point of crediting for the liquid biofuels um, that we're um, suggesting is the point of, of that you can demonstrate delivery to homes in Massachusetts. So that's a category where the homeowner wouldn't hold the credits, but the company delivering the fuels would. Thomas O'Rourke, can we assume the legislature will not be proposing their own version of a clean heat standard? We, we don't have an answer for that right now. Um, and we can certainly check with our legislative liaison. Thank you. June Wooding, how are the values of the ACPs derived? So the ACP for the full electrification um, comes from, was first introduced in the discussion document is consistent with what's, what's used by MassSave and, and MassSave is you know, under a evaluation. So that could change over time. Um, that value is used in 2030. And then as I discussed, we wanna phase in things gradually to make sure we have the system working well. The emission reduction credit value is um, based on the most recently published EPA social cost of carbon value. So I should point out that since it's just as assessed on the emission reduction, not the total emissions, it's not the same as putting a price of carbon on the fuels. It's, it's just associated with the emission reduction part of it. Cole Martin, is there any thought being put into minimizing differences between the clean heat standard being developed in Massachusetts and the clean heat standard being developed in neighboring Vermont? I imagine there will ultimately be some suppliers with obligations in both states. Also, thank you again for hosting this and answering so many questions. Well, we're really focused on the sort of Mar Massachusetts specific marching orders that came out of the Clean Heat Commission and the climate plan. So we're interested in what's happening in other states, but that's our focus is Massachusetts for sure. Michael Riger, will the state of Massachusetts electricity generation, transmission, distribution, greenhouse gas emissions tracked and published on an ongoing basis to compare the greenhouse gas emissions of conventional fuels being phased out under the proposed clean heat standard to show the overall greenhouse gas reduction and efficiency of the program. So I think that's something we'll think about in program evaluation in, in 2028. We also have our statewide inventory and emission reporting programs that help us to um, address those, those kind of monitoring questions. Matthew Wolf, your answer on when we expect this to start was not clear. The requirement is not expected to begin until 2026. Yes, that's correct. Jonathan Parrott, please confirm if these data are correct. A goal of 25,000 full electrified homes per year funded by gas and oil obligations will result in 150 million annually. And this is only one half of the programmatic standard. 
I don't have an answer to that right now, but what I think you're getting at is something we said we'd look at as we refine the, the, the standard more next year, we'll need to look more at the kind of the program impacts overall from the various components. Evan Pitsley, the MassSafe program now is more of a chaotic mess than the MBTA in Massachusetts. Their failures have recently been reported on in local news. Do you actually think this program can be successful while it is being modeled on a failed program? I'll take that as a comment. Thank you. June Wooding, how would network geo projects produce credits for LDCs if the homeowners own the credits beyond the meter? I think there are some special cases where we're going to have to look a little more closely at that kind of question. But in general, we think that'll work like a, a heat pump, a homeowner that has a heat pump that chooses to make that connection. Heidi Clifford, have you considered a double credit for waste biofuels versus a half credit for crop base? The European Union allows for a double count for waste biofuels. I think, I feel like I've covered that enough. I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, it looks like that is all the questions we have at the moment. All right. That's great. So I think we're ready to, to wrap up and I wanna thank everyone for your comments. We got lots of comments, which is exactly what we were looking for. And as Will mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at all your comments. We're reformulating the, uh, or adding to the FAQ. We also have two virtual community meetings scheduled for next week on um, the, the evening of the 11th and the 14th. And after these series of meetings, we will be re, re, uh, regrouping at MassDEP and talking about what our next steps are for additional stakeholder involvement. And uh, hopefully we'll be engaging more with you in the future. So thank you again, I really appreciate it. Will, do you have anything you wanna, you wanna say? No, thanks for the great questions, and we look forward to working on an FAQ document for for to come out to help to address some of them. Well, I think with that we can we can wrap it up. And again, thank you everyone for attending. Appreciate it.